Every month, when I went to Chicago, I would find that some sister had written complaining to Mr. Muhammad that I talked so hard against women when I taught our special classes about the different natures of the two sexes. Now, Islam has very strict laws and teachings about women, the core of them being that the true nature of man is to be strong, and a woman's true nature is to be weak. And while a man must at all times respect his woman, at the same time, he needs to understand that he must control her if he expects to get her respect. But in those days, I had my own personal reasons. I wouldn't have considered it possible for me to love any woman. I'd had too much experience that women were only tricky, deceitful, untrustworthy flesh. I had seen too many men ruined or at least tied down or in some other way messed up by women. Women talk too much. To tell a woman not to talk too much was like telling Jesse James not to carry a gun or telling a hen not to cackle. Can you imagine Jesse James without a gun or a hen that didn't cackle? And for anyone in any kind of a leadership position, such as I was, the worst thing in the world that he could have was the wrong woman. Even Samson, the world's strongest man, was destroyed by the woman who slept in his arms. She was the one whose words hurt him. I mean, I had had so much experience. I had talked to too many prostitutes and mistresses. They knew more about a whole lot of husbands than the wives of those husbands did. The wives always filled their husbands' ears so full of wife complaints that it wasn't the wives, it was the prostitutes and mistresses who heard the husband's innermost problems and secrets. They thought of him and comforted him, and that included listening to him, so he would tell them everything. Anyway, it had been ten years since I thought anything about any mistress, I guess, and as a minister now, I was thinking even less about getting any wife, and Mr. Muhammad himself encouraged me to stay single. Temple Seven Sisters used to tell the brothers, You're just staying single because Brother Minister Malcolm never looks at anybody. No, I didn't make it any secret to any of those sisters how I felt, and yes, I did tell the brothers to be very, very careful. This sister, well... In 1956, she joined Temple Seven. I just noticed her, not with the slightest interest, you understand. For about the next year, I just noticed her. You know, she never would have dreamed I was even thinking about her. In fact, probably, you couldn't have convinced her I even knew her name. It was Sister Betty X. She was tall, brown-skinned, darker than I was, and she had brown eyes. I knew she was a native of Detroit and that she had been a student at Tuskegee Institute down in Alabama, an education major. She was in New York at one of the big hospital schools of nursing. She lectured to the Muslim girls in women's classes on hygiene and medical facts. I ought to explain that each weeknight a different Muslim class or event is scheduled. Monday night, every temple's fruit of Islam trains. People think this is just military drill, judo, karate, things like that, which is part of the FOI training, but only one part. The FOI spends a lot more time in lectures and discussions on men learning to be men. They deal with the responsibilities of a husband and father, what to expect of women, the rights of women which are not to be abrogated by the husband, the importance of the father-male image in the strong household, current events, why honesty and chastity are vital in a person, a home, a community, a nation, and a civilization why one should bathe at least once each 24 hours, business principles and things of that nature. Then, Tuesday night in every Muslim temple is Unity Night, where the brothers and sisters enjoy each other's conversational company and refreshments such as cookies and sweet and sour fruit punches. Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. is what is called student enrollment, where Islam's basic issues are discussed. It is about the equivalent of catechism class in the Catholic religion. Thursday nights are the MGT, Muslim Girls Training, and GCC, General Civilization class, where the women and girls of Islam are taught how to keep homes, how to rear children, how to care for husbands, how to cook, sew, how to act at home and abroad, and other things that are important to being a good Muslim sister and mother and wife. Fridays are devoted to Civilization Night, 
when classes are held for brothers and sisters in the area of the domestic relations, emphasizing how both husbands and wives must understand and respect each other's true natures. Then, Saturday night is for all Muslims a free night, when usually they visit at each other's homes, and of course on Sundays, every Muslim temple holds its services. On the Thursday MGT and GCC nights, sometimes I would drop in on the classes, and maybe at Sister Betty X's classes, just as on other nights I might drop in on the different brothers' classes. At first I would just ask her things like, how were the sisters learning, things like that, and she would say, fine, brother minister. I'd say, thank you, sister, like that, and that would be all there was to it. And after a while, I would have very short conversations with her just to be friendly. One day I thought it would help the women's classes if I took her, just because she happened to be an instructor, to the Museum of Natural History. I wanted to show her some museum displays having to do with the tree of evolution that would help her in her lectures. I could show her proofs of Mr. Muhammad's teachings of such things as that the filthy pig is only a large rodent. The pig is a graft between a rat, a cat, and a dog, Mr. Muhammad taught us. When I mentioned my idea to Sister Betty X, I made it very clear that it was just to help her lectures to the sisters. I had even convinced myself that this was the only reason. Then, by the time of the afternoon I said we would go, well, I telephoned her. I told her I had to cancel the trip, that something important had come up. She said, Well, you sure waited long enough to tell me, Brother Minister. I was just ready to walk out of the door. So I told her, Well, all right, come on then. I I'd make it somehow. But I wasn't going to have much time. While we were down there, offhandedly I asked her all kinds of things. I just wanted some idea of her thinking, you understand? I mean, how she thought. I was halfway impressed by her intelligence and also her education. In those days, she was one of the few whom we had attracted who had attended college. Then right after that, one of the older sisters confided to me a personal problem that Sister Betty X was having. I was really surprised that when she had had the chance, Sister Betty X had not mentioned anything to me about it. Every Muslim minister is always hearing the problems of young people whose parents have ostracized them for becoming Muslims. Well, when Sister Betty X told her foster parents, who were financing her education, that she was a Muslim, they gave her a choice. Leave the Muslims, or they'd cut off her nursing school. It was right near the end of her term, but she was hanging on to Islam. She began taking babysitting jobs for some of the doctors who lived on the grounds of the hospital where she was training. In my position, I never would have made any move without thinking how it would affect the Nation of Islam organization as a whole. I got to turning it over in my mind. What would happen if I should happen sometime to think about getting married to somebody? For instance, Sister Betty X. Although it could be any sister in any temple, but Sister Betty X, for instance, would just happen to be the right height for somebody my height, and also the right age. Mr. Elijah Muhammad taught us that a tall man married to a too short woman or vice versa, they looked odd, not matched. And he taught that a wife's ideal age was half the man's age plus seven. He taught that women are physiologically ahead of men. Mr. Muhammad taught that no marriage could succeed where the woman did not look up with respect to the man and that the man had to have something above and beyond the wife in order for her to be able to look to him for psychological security. I was so shocked at myself when I realized what I was thinking. I quit going anywhere near Sister Betty X or anywhere I knew she would be. If she came into our restaurant and I was there, I went out somewhere. I was glad I knew that she had no idea what I had been thinking about. My not talking to her wouldn't give her any reason to think anything, since there never had been one personal word spoken between us, even if she had thought anything. I studied about if I should happen to say something to her. What would her position be? Because she wasn't going to get any chance to embarrass me. I had heard too many women bragging. I told that chump get lost. I'd had too much experience of the kind to make a man very cautious.
I knew one good thing. She had few relatives. My feeling about in-laws was that they were outlaws. Right among the Temple Seven Muslims, I had seen more marriages destroyed by in-laws, usually anti-Muslim, than any other single thing I knew of. I wasn't about to say any of that romance stuff that Hollywood and television had filled women's heads with. If I was going to do something, I was going to do it directly, and anything I was going to do, I was going to do my way, and because I wanted to do it, not because I saw somebody do it or read about it in a book or saw it in a moving picture somewhere. I told Mr. Muhammad when I visited him in Chicago that month that I was thinking about a very serious step. He smiled when he heard what it was. I told him I was thinking about it. That was all. Mr. Muhammad said that he'd like to meet this sister. The nation by this time was financially able to bear the expenses, so that instructor sisters from different temples could be sent to Chicago to attend the headquarters temple two women's classes, and while there, meet the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in person. Sister Betty X, of course, knew all about this, so there was no reason for her to think anything of it when it was arranged for her to go to Chicago. And like all visiting instructor sisters, she was the house guest of the Messenger and Sister Clara Muhammad. Mister Muhammad told me that he thought that Sister Betty X was a fine sister. If you are thinking about doing a thing, you ought to make up your mind if you are going to do it or not do it. One Sunday night, after the Temple Seven meeting, I drove my car out on the Garden State Parkway. I was on my way to visit my brother Wilfred in Detroit. Wilfred, the year before in 1957, had been made the minister of Detroit's Temple One. I hadn't seen him or any of my family in a good while. It was about ten in the morning when I got inside Detroit, getting gas at a filling station. I just went to their payphone on the wall. I telephoned Sister Betty X. I had to get information to get the number of the nurses' residents at this hospital. Most numbers I memorized, but I had always made it some point never to memorize her number. Somebody got her to the phone finally. She said, "Oh, hello, Brother Minister." I just said it to her direct. Look, do you want to get married? Naturally, she acted all surprised and shocked. The more I have thought about it to this day, I believe she was only putting on an act because women know they know. She said, just like I knew she would, yes. Then I said, well, I didn't have a whole lot of time. She'd better catch a plane to Detroit. I guess by now I will say I love Betty. She's the only woman I ever even thought about loving, and she's one of the very few four women whom I have ever trusted. The thing is, Betty's a good Muslim woman and wife. You see, Islam is the only religion that gives both husband and wife a true understanding of what love is. The Western love concept—you take it apart, it really is lust. But love transcends just the physical. Love is disposition, behavior, attitude, thoughts, likes, dislikes. These things make a beautiful woman, a beautiful wife. This is the beauty that never fades. You find in your Western civilization that when a man's wife's physical beauty fails, she loses her attraction. But Islam teaches us to look into the woman and teaches her to look into us. Betty does this, so she understands me. I would even say I don't imagine many other women might put up with the way I am, awakening this brainwashed black man and telling this arrogant, devilish white man the truth about himself. Betty understands is a full-time job. If I have work to do when I am home, the little time I am at home, she lets me have the quiet I need to work in. I'm rarely at home more than half of any week. I have been away as much as five months. I never get much chance to take her anywhere, and I know she likes to be with her husband. She is used to my calling her from airports, anywhere from Boston to San Francisco or Miami to Seattle, or here lately, cabling her from Cairo, Accra. Or the holy city of Mecca. Once on the long-distance telephone, Betty told me in beautiful phrasing the way she thinks. She said, "You are present when you are away." 